Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I would like to welcome everyone to a session on a very important topic, tips for making succession work in family and generational wealth. My name is Brooke Anderson, and I am the National Managing Principal and Practice Leader for Private Client Services in the United States. As you can see, I am joined today by several professionals whom I would like to introduce. First, let me start by welcoming my colleague, Catherine Grum. Catherine leads BDO UK's Family Office Services Group. Her practice focuses on family offices and enterprising families whom she advises throughout the process of transitioning wealth, helping them to identify their priorities and then implement planning and governance arrangements to support them. Next, I would like to introduce Ed Vanderviver. Ed is a senior advisor and mediator working from our Netherlands office. He has about 23 years of experience in the field of family business consulting, but an even longer experience with family businesses because he started working in his father's business when he was just 19 years old and took over the business from him in 1981. Ed went on to sell his 50% share to a non-family business partner and exited in 1994. Finally, in terms of colleagues, let me introduce Jeff Noble. Jeff is a senior consultant in BDO Canada's advisory services practice. With 25 years of facilitation and coaching experience, he helps family enterprises select private companies and not-for-profits effectively deal with the transition from one stage of their life cycle to the next. The fourth generation to spend several years working in his family's firm, Jeff thoroughly understands the challenges facing privately owned businesses, their key stakeholders, and, high, and the high net worth families they support. Additionally, we have a very special guest joining us today, Alex Scott, a fourth generation family business owner, leader and strategist. Alex is chairman of Schroeder's Global Family Office Service. He joined the company when Schroeder's acquired Sandair, a London-based family office that Alex founded in 1996. He has a personal understanding of the responsibilities and opportunities presented by Family Wealth. Before we get started, one housekeeping note, you will see um, if you do have questions, you may submit them uh, per the slide that you have in front of you. And additionally, we will be have two polling questions that will pop up uh, periodically throughout our presentation. Before we get started with some questions for this great group of experts and panelists, I want to turn the stage over to you, Alex, so that you can share a bit about your background and experience, as it is both incredibly interesting and impressive, uh, and I think will resonate and inspire our audience here today. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about my own personal and family, more about my family business background. Not, not because I think it's an exemplar of, of the perfect story, but I hope it will just illustrate some of the themes that we'll be addressing during the course of this webinar. And perhaps we'll return to certain issues that, so we can talk about them in more depth. But Brooks asked me if I'll just give you a flavour of the family story and my own involvement in it. So we, I'm, I'm um, same as Jeff, I'm a fourth generation uh, family business owner. Um, and I think we see ourselves as a collaborative family. And indeed, I know collaboration is one of the themes of this webinar. If, if, we, if we don't collaborate and we didn't collaborate, then we wouldn't have uh, succeeded in terms of what we've achieved over the last several decades. So we've been in business about 120 years. Um, the original business was created by my great grandfather who was working for another family. He made some of his own capital and he, he decided and he worked out that, that the best future for his children would be if he created a business for his sons to work in. And he, he had this great quote uh, back in 1903, 
if a young man could command capital. He didn't think about, think about his daughters in those days. This was 1903. They weren't going to go to work. If a young man can command capital, his best opportunity is a business of his own. And that's why he founded a business, started it going. And fortunately, his second son, his youngest son, turned out to be a brilliant entrepreneur. The business was an insurance company. Uh, it was in the industrial north of England, where the Industrial Revolution was going on. And uh, they were able to create an insurance company from those origins that over the, over the next, uh, in fact, 90 years, grew to be a substantive business in the UK and globally. Medium-sized in the UK. Um, entrepreneurial business, uh, going back to 1903, how do you break into a, to a very well-established market? Motor cars, they were just coming along. No one knew how to insure them. So the brothers made this their business. They were the first people to offer discounts if you lived in the countryside rather than living in the town. They were the first people to, to, to in, introduce all sorts of innovations to, to, um, to insurance. So I'm sure anybody who, who, is, who is on this call who's part of a family business, they've all got stories like this. How did you go into business? Probably something innovative, something entrepreneurial. Um, my own involvement then uh, was uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. I'd spent a decade doing, just over a decade, spending a career uh, mainly in financial services. Uh, did an MBA in my late 20s, having had an undergraduate degree before that. I was asked, so, I, so as part of this program, um, I, was, I was at this stage, I was the successor. At the end of this story, I'm going to tell you how I've been succeeded. So I've seen both angles of this, of this, uh, of this dynamic. I was asked by my cousin then, um, and a few of us had, had, had gained exposure to the business by serving as outside directors. We, none of the family were working in the business. It employed 2,500 people by then. Complex insurance, banking was also part of it, and investment management. So we were the owners we were able to, to attract and retain talented people to work with us. So I was asked to succeed him, um, 34 years old. Uh, and looking back, I, I don't know why they asked me and I can't think how, how I did it, but you know, um, I did. Um, the industry was going through fundamental changes, not what I expected and not what I anticipated would happen. But because of these fundamental changes in our industry, the risks of the business were changing dramatically. And we all know that if the risks are going up, then, then uh, 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 and the returns are coming more, more, more volatile, then the family, and in terms of my responsibilities, they were to the broad family, as any, any company director, your responsibility is primarily to the shareholders. It's getting more risky. We had a single stock, single company. So we needed to be very confident that we would be rewarded for that risk. And actually, as we worked with management and we looked at projections and we looked at the changes going on in the marketplace, we weren't confident. We felt that the risks were going up and our returns were flatlining. And given that, given they're a fourth generation family, given that a lot of people were reliant on the wealth that we created over the 90 years, it became a rational decision to sell that company. Heavy, a, a heavy heart, personally, I didn't think this was going to happen. I wasn't planning it when I got involved but it was clearly in the interest of the family. So what next? Um, we sold the business to a French company, um, which ultimately became AXA, and loads of you will know that name because that's a powerful global brand. Here was the opportunity for um, my uh, family to decide, is this the end of it or do we stay in business together? So what I did was I um, communicated heavily with them uh, to say, we've got a choice here either this is the end of the road or we can stay together. We can decide if we're owners of a family business and this is the end of the road, or are we a family in business? Because if we're a family in business, then we have the license and the opportunity to move on, to come together and invent something for this generation. So that's what we did. Um, so the next 25 years of my life was, was spent working out where to go, spending a year over that, building a family office to invest the assets that we'd realized, working with the family to come together as a coherent generation, uh, and building the multifamily office into one that also served other families. So 
over 25 years, that, that was the main focus. We also established some other businesses under that same umbrella, also in the financial services sector. So that was the entrepreneurial phase of my life. Um, towards the end of the 2019, we felt the market was changing again. We felt the risks of being in the business we were in were increasing. And we were increasingly concerned that the capital we were providing to this capital, to, to this company, wasn't going to give us the kind of returns that we thought would be justified in terms of the risk we were carrying. So we sold another business. Um, and it sounds like my whole career has been selling businesses, but actually it took us 25 years. So, you know, I think, I think a family can be long term, but long term, and we are long term investors, but long term does not mean forever. And so that, that, that discipline again came back. My responsibility to shareholders, what are the risks we're carrying? Are we going to be rewarded for continuing to own this company? Or would it be better for another owner to, to take it on? We were approached by Schroders, which is family controlled. It's quoted in the UK, but the Schroder family still own nearly 50% of the company. So that culturally felt, felt right for us. And uh, we agreed to, to sell that company to them. And we now have... Uh, what I call a hybrid model, where we've outsourced to, to, the, to the Schroeder's group all our liquidity, but we keep a family office for our, for, our on, for, our, for our trading companies. So we keep together as a family doing some things where we think we can add some value, but we've outsourced the areas which are more to do with the public markets. And I have a role now in the uh, Schroeder's business, as, uh, as Brooke mentioned. So the final point of the story, final point is at the same time as we were selling that company uh i said to my next generation not knowing this was coming i said i didn't know this was coming look i've been doing this 25 years fifth generation time to stand up i don't want to do this forever i like doing what i do but but family business only succeed if it only succeed if you've got succession um one of my and i, I said to the gen they were we, we were all we we get together every two years and i said you as a generation only needs one person, needs a leader. One of that generation approached me about a year later, um, successful in his own right. He just sold a business. Um, he said, I'd like to do something now that involves me working with the family. Uh, so there was an informal process uh, and perhaps we'll talk more about that. But um, I, my board of directors, we've always had non-family directors, uh, my board of directors um, agreed with my recommendation that he should be appointed and he now is running the business and I have um, stepped aside and I'm keeping out of his way. I'm available if he needs me, but I'm keeping out of his way. So on both sides of the equation, and I've been a successor, experience what it's like to step in and I've just gone through the process of being succeeded. So I'll stop there, Brooke. I hope that's a helpful starter to, to all the other stuff we're going to talk about. It was perfect. Thank you so much. And, and just some of the points you made, right? Are we a family business or are we a family in business? Um, and succession doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work or it doesn't succeed unless there's a plan, right? So thank you. It was perfect to set the stage for the presentation today. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. In our discussions related to the preparation of the materials and topics for today's webinar, we decided to focus specifically on three areas as it relates to effective succession. Communication, collaboration, and preparation of the next generation. All three of these areas are critically important, and we're going to spend a little bit of time in each of them sharing our comments, advice, and experience. Before we dive in, we're going to take our first poll um, for our audience. So it will be launched. Which of these three, collaboration or a communication, collaboration, or preparation of the next generation, is the one that is most concerning to you or of most interest to you? And while that's launching and you guys are answering, I'm going to go ahead and continue on. So first, communication. It is said in the context of family succession and wealth transition, there are three keys to success, communication, communication, and communication. One might think that communication would be easily easy and come naturally to members of the same family. Jeff, you have advised and counseled many families throughout your 25 years of experience. 
Would you mind sharing your experience as it relates to intra-family communication? Uh, now you'll hear me, Ed. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. I was saying good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for uh, cutting out an hour of your time to spend with us today. We really, we know that's a privilege. We know people are busy and we do very much appreciate this opportunity to share some of our experience and insights with you. And hopefully we'll learn a bit from, uh, from you as participants and your, your answers to the polls that we'll be using today. Uh, Alex, a special thank you to you for sharing your family story. It's, uh, it's truly inspiring, and, and as Brooke suggested, the way you've separated being a family and business together from having a family business, I think is a really key distinction. Regarding communication, Brooke, yes, it's critically important, and one would think that families would, would have no problem communicating. And in fact, families do communicate. I would suggest to you they communicate, but not in a very good way. They don't communicate well with each other, uh, very often very inward looking, not open, not transparent, and we work with families to encourage them to find ways to communicate in what I'll call a positive way. And experience tells us that when families get together to discuss things, and it could range from what color to paint the kitchen to where to take a family vacation, uh, all the way up to starting to talk about succession in a business or how they're going to manage wealth, their conversations very typically devolve. And by that, I mean, they start, you know, families have literally a lifetime of history. So if the youngest family member is 20 years old, they have at least 20 years of history together. And then I'll go up from there, depending on other siblings. And when I talk about these, these conversations devolving, they start uh, weighing on uh, and, and, and uh, their siblings, uh, their siblings' principles and values. And these are things, as we well know, are in our core, and we can't really move people off of that. History and relationships come into play, as do personalities and moods. And these are things that you know, we're not going to change in anyone. Certainly, we can't change history. These backward-looking dialogues are what typically happen. We do find if a family can find a way to, to get more positive in their communication, which is going to mean not dealing in the way they may remember something or perception, but really dealing in facts and data, having some structures. And a structure for communication, book is critically important. And thirdly, and this is perhaps the most important thing, is having a shared common vision about where they want to go and focusing on that. So communication is natural, Brooke. Positive communication uh, may need to be a learned skill for many families. Thank you, Jeff. Alex, clearly when it comes to communication, leadership is critical and essential to ensuring first that it happens and second that it is effective and productive in nature and positive as Jeff suggested. Would you mind sharing some of your thoughts and advice related to this? Yeah. Um, we're a big family, so there's, there's, there's a hundred of us now. Uh, I don't know all my family well. We don't spend a lot of time together. Um, but I'm, I feel privileged in that they've en enabled me to be in a position to offer some leadership to them. Now, how 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 has that happened? Um, I, it, it must be that between us we have communicated our collective desires, our collective objectives, and that we continue to reinforce them. So so initially um, it was on a one to one basis. That was the only way I was going to work with my generation to say let's build on this and let's move forward. One to one in their own homes in their own time, in their own environment, because I was one of the youngest in my generation and I just had a plan, I had an idea. Um, thereafter, it's built and it's built and it's built. And we've had to be more structured because there's more of us. We've had to be more purposeful and we've had to create a rhythm in the communication. It's not enough just to be firing off the odd thing. There needs to be predictable communication dealing with certain things. We've also put in place all sorts of media because certain people receive information and communication differently. Some, some of it's written, some of it's on a website, some of it's in PowerPoint, some of it's in a video, all sorts of ways to, to bring together uh, this, this broad family into a collaborative whole. And, you know, some people don't, some people tune out. It's just not what they want to do, what they want to be. That's fine. That's fine. 
because I think that 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 however, if they if they at the margin just like being part of this family, and they continue to be part of this family, then then we have to accept that. And I think that 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 creating a form of communication that keeps all the people just at the core, both at the core and at the periphery, involved, engaged, and knowing what's going on is is really important. But also giving people space to receive the communication and not communicate back until they're ready. Great points, thank you. Jeff, we hear a lot about governance and its importance in ensuring effective communication. How do you define governance and why would you say it's so important? Great question, Brooke. Governance is something that's been around for a long, long time. We talk about being governed by people that we elect to office. So it's been around a while in the context of a family and business. And I'd like to qualify at the outset here, if I may, Brooke, that when we, we speak about a family and business, it could be a business with a single or number of operating companies. It could be a family investing together in a real estate portfolio. It could be a family investing together in a, in a different type of investment portfolio, public markets, private equity, private debt, and so on, or some combination of that. The point of it is it is a family, an enterprising family, a family group that is just working to stay together and do things together. By way of governance, uh, two things, and I, I guess by way of defining governance, I'm gonna suggest it's two things. Firstly, communication. How are we gonna communicate? Where are we gonna communicate? When are we going to communicate? Alex outlined a bunch of different ways this family's communicating. And secondly, how are we going to make decisions together as a family? Mm -hmm. So the communication piece, we talk about and advocate for, and we know what works well is inclusive communication. So err on the side, if you're, if you're looking at, at enhancing your communication structures and your communication practices within your family, within your business, if you have a board of directors, board of advisors and so on, I, we would encourage you to err on the side of inclusion rather than exclusion. And there's gonna be some rules around that. This is when we get to the decision-making part. In addition to that, it's very important to be as transparent as possible. Now, I get asked quite a bit with regards, especially to transparency and inclusion, you know, what age do we, do we bring that next generation into some of these meetings? And the best thing we've been able to come up with, uh, and this is again, based on experience in working with families, is when the, a person in the next generation is old enough to, the term being, to keep a secret. Now, we all have, some of us have kids, and I can speak from my own experience. Our, our firstborn child is now in her mid-30s and couldn't keep a secret to save her soul. Our youngest, who's, uh, I think, about eight years her junior, very good at keeping secrets. So it's not, it's, it's difficult to put a number on these things. But there are going to be conversations happening in a family context that need to be kept private and need to be kept confidential. So for bringing these younger folks in that aren't yet able to keep a secret, they can be at least present for part of the meeting and do some good listening and do some good learning. On the side of, of decision making, families will look at, are we going to, is it majority rules? Is it going to be a super majority, which might mean to some families two thirds or 70%? Is it going to be unanimity? Is it going to be compromise? Or lastly, is it going to be uh, making decisions by consensus? And by consensus, this is something that often takes longer because it's a process by which each person is allowed to state their views, to ask questions, not to be judged. And at the end of the, of the, of the let's call it a meeting or a session to make a decision, it's going to be, are you consenting to agree to what we've decided on today? So that's what consensus means literally is consent to agree. And we find that if the, those that will be impacted by the decision have had the opportunity to participate in making that decision, that they're going to be much more bought into the decision and to the way forward. In addition to that, and I think this is a key piece on the governance side is communication and decision-making. I've talked about a little bit, accountability is critical. So if I participated in the decision, I then need to agree to be held accountable by way of implementation and execution. In addition to that, um, you are agreeing to allow me to hold you accountable. So we get some sort of, we'll call it 360 degree accountability built into it when there's been decision-making made uh, by way of a consensus. So Brooke, we're gonna be building out for governance some family policies or family rules. These things certainly do evolve over time. And these rules or policies will be based on 
family's philosophies and the family's principles and values. So even before getting to that, to, the, to creating the, these governance policies and governance rules, a family is well advised to get together and to have a look at what they think their values are and to get some common set of values that resonate with the family that everyone understands and everyone is able to articulate well. And they can then use these values as a decision filter to be looking ahead a number of generations and talking about what their mission may be and ultimately what their vision is, what their goals and objectives are as a family in business together or a family investing together. Again, operating company, family office, whatever it may be. And once we have articulated and understood values, a mission, mission, same as purpose, and understand this vision of where we're going, those things then become a filter as we start to make decisions on how we, or, or, I'm sorry, start to put rules in place on how we're going to make decisions together, how and when we're going to communicate, and so on. I think that's my time on that one, Brooke. Thank you very much. And your you. talk of consensus is perfect to lead us right into collaboration, which is what we are going to focus on a bit now. Great. So we're looking at collaboration across generations, uh, both horizontally and vertically, meaning between those in the same generation, as well as with those who are older and younger. Ed, let's turn to you. What are your experiences with collaboration between family members in family enterprises? Thank you, Brooke, and uh, thank you also, Jeff and Alex, for their valuable words and lessons. Um, good to take them with you. My experience with uh, collaboration, um, it's of course very broad and um, happily most of the time a very positive um, uh, because it's one of the powers of and distinct powers of family businesses and family enterprises that family members can collaborate very good together. But um, a part of my time I spend on mediations and conflict resolution, um, working with um, families and looking back the, the uh, last years, five years, I noticed that about 80% of my, and I, I did a kind of a statistic, about 80% of the mediations I did was about relational problems between siblings in family enterprises. Um, and when you dig deeper in those um, problems uh, where people, because you have to start at the outside and then work to the inside to find the real causes. And, and real causes are often uh, made about where does the collaboration come from? Where does it originate? Does it originate from their ambition to work together or has it another source? And well, in, in most cases, collaboration between siblings originates uh, in the principle of equality from parents to their offspring um, without realizing often that that's a family interest and not the business interest. Um, and that's often a motive for succession planning, looking at ownership structures uh, and management fees. Uh, I think uh, you all recognize them in family businesses, how they're divided and how things are handled and not by the ambitions of siblings to really uh, do business together. Because of that, there's no focus or awareness on understanding um, the art of collaboration, what it means. People underestimate the fact and will say, well, we're having a very good relationship. We never have an argument together and we're always able to solve the arguments we have. So we're able to collaborate. Uh, well, and that's not true, uh, but they found find that out the hard way. Uh, and in general, people aren't aware of their individual differences, and that's on the, that's what makes collaboration different, difficult. Uh, like um, talent, uh, ambition, energy, home situation, health. Uh, don't forget the outlaws uh, talking uh, for a lot of people. Um, and they don't realize what the impact of those differences is on the way they work and interact with each other. And all these things add up to destructive behavior patterns ending up in what seems to be a conflict, but in reality is a relational crisis where mutual trust and respect are gone um, if they're too late, and that's often the case. Uh, and uh, with them, the most important conditions uh, for col collaboration. 
So a lot of those mediation ends up in exit uh, mediations, which makes it even more complex. And if we look at intergenerational collaboration, there are a lot of other challenges. And one of them is the fact that transfers and successors are in totally different phases of their lives. Mm -hmm. That alone makes it hard to understand each other. Aside from that, parent-child relationship is psychologically the most complex relationship that exists if you have a business or not. Um, it's just a, a general uh, thing in, in the human being, um, which makes it very hard to discuss delicate matters where succession uh, planning is often a part of uh, without ending up in an emotional roller coaster. Thank you. And sometimes it seems transfers, in fact, maybe often it seems transfers don't trust their successors, which are actually oftentimes the individuals they themselves appoint or identify as the successor. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, we can talk a lot about if they have, if they should trust their successors, uh, but assuming that identifying and appointing successors happens on the base of proven capacities, objectively, that's also a, a, a point of attention uh, within family businesses. It isn't logical for the transfer to doubt the abilities of his successor or successors. But in my experience, transfers often use the lack of trust in their successors as an excuse to cover up the real reasons for not being able to step aside and make room for the next generation. Most transfers who are reluctant to step down from their throne are dealing with identity issues. Transfers whose identity is based on their status as an entrepreneur, often being the face of the company, lose the fundament of their identity of who they are. And that's an unconscious, mostly unconscious process. Um, but I always say it scares the hell out of them. Um, and they should prepare themselves for this process, starting on time in an early stage with retirement planning and not only looking about the financial aspects of that, uh, like uh, income and, and, and taxes, but also about finding a new fundament for their changing identity. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Catherine, you've had almost 20 years of counseling families as they attempt to work collaboratively in your experience, what have you found that holds families back from working that way on a succession plan? And why is that so important? Oh, thank you, Brooke. Um, you know, certainly uh, the first thing I would say is that if you look at successful generative families who have continued some form of family enterprise across generations, they're almost all able to collaborate in, in the, the way in which Ed talks about. Uh, and I think succession planning is, is an important element of that where uh, collaboration is, is particularly critical. If we're talking about succession planning and uh, take a step back and defining what we actually mean by that first, it's not just the legal transfer of ownership in assets or perhaps appointing the next chair or the next CEO. It's really about the future generations and how they make a success of the family legacy and continue it and fulfill their own individual potential as well. And when you think about it in that context, then you need to work collaboratively in order to develop the future vision and understand what the potential and the aspirations are for that next generation. Um, it's very difficult to do that without at least some input from the next gen, the, the rising generations. Once you've got that future vision, then you can take a step back and look at where things are now and the succession planning is mapping the route really from where things are now to that future vision and, and what you need to do in order to get there um, and this really will have um, if you're talking about any significant wealth you know the potential for, to have a major impact on the lives of those rising generations and if you think of most of them are going to be adults at the point at which they start to get more involved and as an adult, people, and you know, as a child, even let alone an adult, people don't like things being done to them. Um, if they've got the ability and the opportunity to, to put some input into the process, they can help shape the vision. And therefore, it's, it's much more something that they buy into, they engage with, they want to participate in as part of the future. 
And it also involving them in that gives them the opportunity to under, understand the perspectives of the senior generation, why they are thinking about doing things in a particular way, what their hopes or their concerns are. You know, particularly if you're thinking about succession planning and, and creating something like a trust, often not always the, there are tax reasons as part of the thinking behind that, you know, how you structure it in a particular way. But the longer, broader objectives are not about tax. They're about the impact on those individuals. And that can get lost if they're not involved in the conversation and they only find out years later, for example, in the reading of a will. Um, and I think the, the other thing I would say about collaboration is that it doesn't have to be handing over to the next generation to make the decisions. It really depends on the family and the circumstances. It starts, if you like, with an inform, you know, informing them um, you can move on to give them a degree of influence, even if you don't want to go all the way in and let them make certain decisions. And there's families I'm working with um, where the, the sort of senior generation are in the 50s and the, the rising generation are in their 20s. And the, the senior generation have a plan in mind and they are now speaking to and involving uh, those juniors with my sort of help and support to help refine the details of the plan but the, the plan is kind of broadly in trade but at least they've got that um, opportunity to influence. Thanks Catherine. Have you found any changes in dynamics between the senior and rising generation uh, as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, that's a, a, another really interesting question. And I think um, it should be there, there is a poll we have to uh, see what everyone else's perspectives are on that to see whether you've seen a uh, change in dynamics. So hopefully if Lara can uh, put that up. Um, I think, you know, firstly, uh, we've already touched on it briefly, but it's really important to understand which generations are involved, what, what age and stage they're at, uh, because there are different characteristics of different generations. Um, and these are while they are kind of broad generalizations, they tend to be shaped by the circumstances of that generation growing up, the you know, external conditions, the, the environment, financial circumstances, um, the parenting styles, which have changed over the years. Uh, and particularly, you know, now we talk a lot about you know, millennials, and Gen Z, um, having quite you know, significant characteristics and, and particularly sort of millennials wanting to speak up. Um, that is something that, has been challenging I think family dynamics whereas traditionally you wouldn't have seen the, those generations coming forward as much and one of the things I think has been really interesting about the pandemic um, putting aside obviously the you know the very challenging circumstances for many is that it has given many of the rising generation an opportunity to step up whether it's in relation to the, the digitization of the business, the way in which they've had to use and adapt to technology, virtual working, you know, enabling the family to come together on Zoom or Teams or whatever. Actually, there are opportunities for the rising generations to really make an impact from quite an early stage, whereas historically, it, the, the tradition was typically you had to kind of earn your stripes and work your way up and through before you could start making that impact. Um, there's a growing urgency though now from younger rising generations about how um, families with wealth address certain issues um, you know the moment in the UK in particular we're really kind of aware of the COP26 discussions around the environment and there's also social implications and I think um, there again depending on how the families have responded those families who are engaging with those discussions um, and involving the different generations to get their perspectives um, will have sort of very positive dynamics. But I know um, that kind of that it is placing tension in some families who um, perhaps haven't yet worked out a good, healthy way to communicate and understand the different perspectives and the right approach to that. Um, and then, you know, for those next generations who haven't really been let into the process. There are um, you know, conversations I'm having increasing frustration that they aren't able to, to have an input and to help them and play a part. And there's a potential for those families, for those next generations to become disengaged. Uh, the final thing I would say, I think is always interesting when you're looking at, at 
the generations and what they're doing and you know, picking up on Alex's point he, he made earlier about um, going and studying for an MBA there is a real I think um, quest in that those rising generations for something to to sort of ground them within the family and that kind of their if you like their legitimacy um, there's a, a really interesting book coming out next year that that looks at this in a bit more detail um, but you know particularly if the senior generation have been very successful how that next generation make their mark um, and kind of own who they are and what they can do is a really important part of those overall family dynamics very interesting points and you know perhaps unanticipated um, consequences of the pandemic right for this the next generation becoming so involved in wanting to be and what their focus is on. Alex, it is clear that collaborative efforts are needed or a transition will not be successful. Would you mind sharing with us some of your thoughts around this? Yeah, um, it's absolutely right. The, the, um, let, me, let me sort of break that down and I've been reflecting while we've been talking about collaboration that you there's only a point in collaboration if you know the direction you want to head what you're there for what you're in a group together for um and in order to do that you probably need leadership you probably need somebody to help form the consensus to stimulate the consensus to come together um so so that so i think as a group in order to be collaborative somebody must be given permission to lead and equally, I, I would say that within this collaborative group, um, everybody needs to recognize that there's dignity and purpose in following that leader, whoever that leader will be. I think the interesting thing in a family context is you can have different leaders for different things. It's not all the same person. There can be different functions within the family, different, different areas that you collaborate that gives role to multiple people. So in our own sense we have formal boards of directors make decisions drive companies forward we have family shareholder councils where the owners get together to to hear the good the bad and the ugly about what's going on and express their opinions to those boards of directors and we have a family council which is about family engagement and education all three different places all three different areas have different leaderships different forms of collaboration but, they, but they're absolutely critical. We, we did a lot of work on why. Uh, and I, I should say now, um, we've had um, expert, uh, expert help, external help uh, to help us get there. Uh, we couldn't have done that. We couldn't have had done, we couldn't have got where we have today in terms of our structures and our direction and our abilities to collaborate without an external perspective, perspective on our business. And you're not paying me to say that, I know, but, but uh, <laughs> I just thought I'd make the point. Um, but I think that the, um, I've just lost my thread a bit there, but I think the, the, the capacity, to, uh, yes, we did, we did some work. Why are we, why are we doing this together? Um, and we, we came together uh, uh, in a facilitated format and our conclusion was that as, as, as inheritors of something, our job is to be a steward uh, and stewardship is what we're about. And we're very purposeful about that stewardship. So that means to look after, but it also means to grow. It also need, means to recognize what you have, make it better, take it forward for, for subsequent owners. And for us, that, that worked as an element of cohesion. Yes, we get that. Let's not be the generation that screw things up. Let's be the generation that take this forward. So once you've got that, that for us has been the glue for even enhanced collaboration. Because then we've got a purpose. If you've got a purpose mm -hmm. and you've got some leadership, you can collaborate. So it's been a it's been a long process. This involving multiple generations and multiple inputs. But it, but it, and we continue to work at it. And it's not always easy because you don't always want to work with your siblings or your cousins. And you and you uh, but. But in terms of us understanding, wait, there's a higher purpose here. It's, it's where actually this may be this may be not where you want to be today. And it may be irritating at the same old stuff Jeff was referring to as we cropping up again. But let's let's look above and beyond that. Let's be purposeful stewards and that and, 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 and coming together and agreeing on this on this purpose uh, has enabled us to to collaborate at a higher level, I think.
hope that answers your question. To That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jeff, it seems your comments as to governance are critical as it relates to collaborative efforts and the creation of alignment. Um, and I think that's kind of what you were just talking about, Alex, is this alignment. Jeff, why is alignment so important in moving forward with the transition from the now generation to the next generation and ultimately the rising generations? Awesome. Let me build a bit on, if I may, Alex, on, on what, you, what you talked about. There are innumerable dynamics at play with this whole thing. We've got um, a family or a number of families. So it could be the, the greater family. Then there's each generation uh, with siblings. Each sibling has their own family. Cousins have their own families and so on. There's the business or the portfolio. There's also the ownership piece. Now, Alex talked about, and I love this because it really, it really enhances comments made earlier around the importance of communication and where and how to communicate. So there's a family council that discusses family matters and, and is often used as a liaison between the family and the business and between the family and the ownership group. There's a board of directors that may be helping on ownership issues. What do we do with capital in the business? We uh, distribute to shareholders, reinvest in the business, uh, manage debt and so on. And of course the business, which is uh, arguably, I've, I've often heard the metaphor of the, of the operating company or the investment portfolio being the ATM for the family. And this is where really everything comes from that, that supports the family. And with all these dynamics at play, we very soon see what I described earlier, and I'm gonna call them now conflicted interests. How do we manage those conflicted interests? And we know from experience in working with families that if the family is able to find, as Alex suggested, a common purpose to get aligned around, then they've got a direction and a way forward. So the now generation has its own interests, uh, for better or worse, they have their own interests. Ed talked about that parent-child dynamic being one of the most complex relationships uh, that any of us have. Uh, we had, may still have parents or had parents. That was a relationship. And we have our children. And there's that, trying to manage that whole thing. And then there's the next generation. So the next generation has its concerns around getting along with each other, as well as getting along with their parents. So you start to see how complex, uh, how complex things get woven when, we, when we're looking at all the dynamics and communication going on among these people. And Brooke, when there's alignment, alignment builds trust. When there's a common interest and we truly believe in that common interest, we have a purpose. I talked a lot earlier about values. This alignment will allow the family to truly become stewards as Alex defined it. I loved your definition of stewardship. We're looking after this. We have a responsibility to the asset and we have responsibility to our family to continue growing this asset in a way that we can find it to agree on for that next generation. We have use of this only for a short time. So Brooke, alignment around all these things, values, principles, common goals, common vision, and a purpose is gonna help the family stay in business together. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Ed, would you mind just sharing some key factors for a minute or two that are needed for successful collaboration between siblings in a family enterprise? And we'll round out this section with with yeah. your comments there. Yes, of course. Thank you. Well, it, it's not so um, uh, complicated uh, and contrary to uh, parent-child uh, dynamics, like you have told. Um, but the, for, let's first address the parents. Um, I think it's good. And, and secondary, it's also uh, a message to the uh, successors. But first, the parents that they, I really would urge them to realize that the principle of equality between siblings is a family interest. It's very uh, understandable and it has all kinds of reasons and it has all kinds of causes and history, but it's not a business interest. And at least consider and discuss other options for ownership structures and management fees. That's the only thing. I don't say that you have to divide from or that you have to uh, really do it really different, but at least disc consider and discuss other options because I see a lot of families who just uh, skip that step and regret it later. Um, next, focus on collaboration and individual differences during succession process. Working out individual differences on um, collaboration. And you can start early enough with that. I uh, Last year, I did a next gen in family with 14 family members from three families. And the youngest was 11 and the oldest was 32. And it was a successful workshop we did on two Saturdays. 
Um, building a structural communication, that's part of it, and that's really connecting to what's been told uh, before. Building a structural communication where collaboration and communication mm -hmm. are always on the agenda, and it should always be there every time they talk about it. Thank you. Alex and Catherine, you both express the importance of a certain mindset as it relates to the next generation moving into leadership and that it should be viewed as an opportunity and not an obligation. Um, and that next generation, they have to be prepared. Alex, would you mind starting us off here and talking about the importance of learning opportunities for that next generation? Certainly. Um, I, I just pick up first of all on your point about uh, preparation. I, I think any aspiring successor uh, needs to understand, coming back to the points you've already made, that, that, that whoever is in a position of leadership now uh, will have some form of resistance to being succeeded um, and is going to take a risk on you because you're an unknown. You, you may be related, but, you, but, but nobody knows how you're going to, how you're going to achieve this. So, so my, my advice to anybody who, who is thinking about succeeding is, is um, think about the skills, experiences, networks that you need to build to do this well. And because every business needs to be refreshed and reinvigorated and be taken into new areas, you're unlikely to find those where you are if you're in your business. I would, I would, I would urge um, prospective uh, successes to find experiences and 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 roles they can play that that bring in perspectives and knowledge because then they can bring not only their own credentials uh, and their own self confidence because they've led something somewhere else they've done something somewhere else and their knowledge and the and the and the network that they that they've built on the by themselves in conjunction with the family if it may be. But that, that in itself can be empowering for them and it can be refreshing for the business. So I think um, this, this sort of uh, necessity, in my view, is, is to recognize that no one's entitled to lead. Uh, you're only entitled to lead when you've gained the experiences and the respect of having been a leader and you're, and you're likely to do that externally. But even if you can't do that, think about what extra you're going to bring or, or what extra the family is going to help this person bring. So I was lucky I went off to do a, a course, um, but, but, I've, but I've continually attended uh, family business conferences, met my peers, met other family business owners, heard, heard how they are. Everything I've learned and we implement now, I've learned from other people, either professional advice or because of just rubbing shoulders with, with, other, with other families. So it's an ongoing lifelong uh, determination to keep learning about your family, but also think about what you can bring and, and bring the best of you to as, as a successor and families helping successors to bring the best of themselves mm -hmm. because none of us will be perfect for the role. We'll all have, have some issues that need to be addressed or supplemented. Sorry, Catherine, I've, I've gone on a bit long. I'll hand on to you. Such, such great points. Um, Catherine, in your professional opinion, when should a family start preparing the next generation and how should it be done? Yeah, I think um, we've already had some good suggestions um, around that from others. Like, what I would add is, firstly, um, a reason I often hear for people not starting to prepare and involve the next generation is that they're protecting them um, and giving them the information is going to cause entitlement. Um, and I would just say there are different ways of protecting the next and the rising generation and actually preparing them in my opinion is one of the best ways of protecting them um, because you arm them with information knowledge understanding and and what preparation means you know I don't think you can start too young in terms of sharing the family values and history and actually starting to build just basic financial aware awareness you use age appropriate techniques but even with primary school children, you can start getting them thinking about saving and actually having different pots of money for money they're saving to spend on themselves, money they're perhaps saving for other you know, presents or to give to charity. Um, at secondary school, you can get them involved in raising money for charity, even do that younger or uh, planning holidays and budgeting. And there's lots of things you can do. Um, in terms of sharing the financials, I mean, I think a good point made about the sort of being able to keep a secret, but also you can start to share some information, for example, by letting them know they're in the top 1% of family wealth in the country without necessarily giving them the balance sheet at that point in time. 
And in my opinion, it's better that you're informing them and you're controlling the narrative than they're learning from elsewhere, given how much information there is out there. And if entitlements are concerned, there are lots of things you can do. You know, if you understand what the risk is you're trying to protect against, then you can take steps to mitigate. And if it's entitlement, um, understanding what's gone into building the wealth and the cost and, uh, and understanding value is one thing. Another is um, they'll learn directly from what their parents and others in the family are doing. So being aware of that early on. Um, and then thirdly, having conversations about expectations. What might they expect as um, you know, being part of the family and what are the limitations and what's expected of them in return? And all those start to build up that defense. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Seems like communication is critical there. <laughs> Alex, maybe let's just turn to you for a couple last comments in this area. If you could share a bit or two of advice as it relates to the transition to the next gen. Oh, um, you know, it's hard. It's hard, but it has to be done. First of all, you have to create an environment in which you have a successor who wants to succeed. In other words, the role is attractive and fitted, fitted to their skills. Secondly, there needs to be a process which is deemed by all others who may be part of this uh, group who may wish to lead, a, a process that is fair. Even if it's, it, it, you know, fair doesn't mean equal. It, it means a process that is fair. Uh, and, and I think this concept is really important. And, and I, I think I've been lucky in that, in that I put in place a process, a candidate emerged who is universally welcomed and celebrated by his generation as being, as being the leader for the, for the, for the current times. So I have no, no, no specific way to, to advise other than to say it must be done. The earlier you do it, I think the better, because if it doesn't work out, you, you can help. Um, and, to, to make sure that the process is, is seen to be fair. Thank you, thank you. Jeff, Ed and Catherine, we have a, a, just a couple minutes left. If each of you could maybe just give your parting words of wisdom um, or advice and Jeff, we can start with you. Sure, thanks Brooke very much. Alex, I love that it's, it's hard, but it has to be done. Families uh, in business together, families that are investing together and so on, um, that have a shared set of values, that have a shared purpose, need to intentionally create ways to, to have a place to have what I'm going to call open, safe communication. And this is where the parent-child dynamic maybe needs to disappear for a time so that everyone has a similar voice and importantly, everyone has an opportunity to be heard and to be understood. This whole succession piece is a process uh, that the family has a responsibility to see through. And that process is a gradual transition of management, leadership, ownership and control. And they're not, they, they, they're not going to be the same process and it may or may not be the same people. So I'll come back to it, communicate, communicate, and then communicate some more. Thanks, Jeff. Ed, we'll turn to you. Yeah, well, also referring to Alex, um, um, obviously in his story, his family has a, a, a decent set of standards regarding communication and collaboration implemented. And that's uh, working well for them. Uh, and, and maybe that's that's the message I want to give uh, all the people who are listening and, and watching is um, be critical, look in the mirror and see if you got that kind of stand, set of standards implemented and if it's still working uh, because it needs maintenance, it needs evaluation. Um, and even if you don't have, if you discover that you don't have that set of standards, start working on it and don't only focus on education, skills and experience, but also from early age on collaboration and learning how to deal with individual differences within the next generation. Thank you, Ed and Catherine. I would just say, don't start when you need succession, start earlier because it does take time. There's a lot of preparation and thought involved. Uh, and families always put it off and it goes down the priority list uh, because other more pressing and urgent things come up. Um, but allow it time and start before it becomes urgent and then you'll do it justice. Thank you. 
That takes us to the end of our webinar. I want to thank um, my colleagues, Catherine, Ed, and Jeff, and especially you, Alex, for joining us. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your insight and your experience. Thank you to our attendees as well for uh, questions that were submitted that we obviously did not have a chance to answer, at least directly. Um, Please go ahead and thank you for putting this slide up. Please go ahead and know that you can submit them. If, even if you still have them, we will connect with you individually to ensure that they are answered and addressed. So I hope everyone has a great rest of the day or evening, wherever you are. And thank you again for attending. Pleasure. Nice to meet everybody. Bye. Thanks so much.